Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. In this video, I'm going to give you an introduction to infrared photography. Now, over the years, I've received quite a few questions about infrared photography. And to tell you the truth, it's not something that I really got into until very recently. Thanks to the many kind people that used my affiliate links and or made donations and or became my Patreon, I was able to purchase an infrared camera and I really got into it recently and I'm going to pass on what I learned to you. Now if you're interested in helping me make better more varied videos please consider be using my affiliate links or making a donation or becoming my Patreon. If you look at the top right hand corner of this video you'll see an I. Click on that I and you'll get some info on how you could help me make better videos. All right, to really understand infrared photography, you just have to know a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, included in the electromagnetic spectrum is the visible light, the visible light that we see. That's roughly from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers is the light that we see, that our eyes are sensitive to. Now, anything below that on this chart, these, these higher wavelengths, that's got a lot more energy and th those would kill you. So fortunately, that gets filtered out by Earth's atmosphere. But anything above this um, wavelength or this visible spectrum uh, section of the ele electromagnetic spectrum, everything above that still kind of floats around and it's there. We just don't see it. Well, cameras actually can see infrared light, but Typically in cameras today, they put a filter in front of the sensor so that anything above visible light gets not totally blocked out, but essentially and virtually blocked from the sensor so that only the visible light will affect the sensor and the sensor will only be sensitive to the visible light. Well, there's a couple different, there's actually three different ways you could create infrared images. One of the ways, and the most expensive way, is you could buy cameras that are infrared cameras. Um, Fujifilm has the Fujifilm X-T1. They actually make an infrared version of that camera. It's around $1,700. But from what I understand, they won't sell it to the average person. You have to be someone in the forensic or medical field to purchase it because infrared photography is very popular and it's, it's a useful tool in forensics. But I'm, I'm not sure why Fuji doesn't make that camera available to everyone. Maybe it's just because they don't want that out there that much. I don't know. There are other cameras out there. Again, they're very expensive. I didn't go that route. I didn't buy a camera that was already created to produce infrared images. The cheapest way you could go is you could just buy a filter to put on your lens. Now, I mentioned that the sensor sees the visible light and it has a filter in front of the sensor inside of your camera. There's a filter there that blocks infrared light. But fortunately, for most cameras, it doesn't block it completely. It's more or less kind of like an ND filter. And when you use fractional shutter speeds, which is the typical shot with a camera is some fraction of a, sh of a second, that infrared light that does leak through that sensor or leak through that filter doesn't really affect the sensor at all. So it, the sensor is effectively only seeing the visible light. When you put these filters on the front of your lens, what the filter does, it blocks all the visible light and only allows infrared light through. When it does that, now that infrared light that does get through will hit that filter that's in front of your sensor. So that's going to only let a little of it through. So what happens when you use a filter on the front of your lens is you're going to get longer shutter speeds. So this is the cheapest way to go, but it may might not be the most convenient or give you the best results because you have to put your camera on a tripod. Now, if you are interested in this, the filters to get a decent one will run around a hundred bucks, probably a little more. So they're still kind of expensive. And I'm going to have links below this video to all the stuff I talk about. And I will have a link to this website and this article 
that explains what you need to know if you want to go this route to put a filter on the front of your lens. And first thing I'll mention real quick it, is you just may need to test your camera and make sure that it allows some infrared light through. And that's very easy to do. Just put your camera in live view and then have someone stand in front of the camera and shine a remote, a TV remote, into the lens. Like have them stand back, not right on top of the lens. Just stand, stand back. And if through live view of your camera you see the infrared LED glowing, then that means some infrared light is getting through to the sensor. It's getting through that infrared filter. Then you should be good to go. And you could purchase a filter, screw it on your lens, and you'll get some infrared images. Again, it's going to lengthen your shutter speed. And it all is explained in this article, and I'll have that here. Now, the third way that you could go is you could actually convert a normal camera so that it only sees infrared, or you could buy a camera that's already been converted. I went that route. And there's two main companies that do this. And I don't have an affiliation with any of these companies. I'm going to have links to both of them below. They're, I'm not an affiliate. I don't, have, I don't talk to them. I don't, I'm not friends with them. Nothing like that, all right? One of them is LifePixel, and I think this one might be the most popular. You could send them a camera, and they'll convert it to infrared and send it back to you. Or they have cameras for sale that are already converted, used cameras that are already converted. The other com company, and it does the same exact thing, is Kalari Vision. And again, they have all different pricing. It depends on your camera, uh, the model, stuff like that. You could come here. So if you have like a, an old DSLR, one of your, maybe your entry level one that you don't use anymore, see if it could be converted to uh, infrared and how much it would cost. And you could send it off to one of these companies and get it converted. or if you have a little extra money and you want to go this route, you could buy one that is already converted. Now, I went that route, but I kind of cheaped out a little bit on it. What I did was, is I looked around and I went on eBay and I found that on eBay, Kalari Vision was selling this Panasonic Lumix, Lumix SZ7, 14.1 megapixel, already converted infrared camera. Now, it's a used camera. It's not brand new. And when I got mine, just to tell you, there was like a little scratch on it. There was a tiny little dent in the corner. So it's not brand new. You don't get all the box with all the stuff. You do get the charger and the battery, and that's pretty much it. So it's already converted. It ran $200. Now, the camera I don't think is made anymore, and I mentioned it's a, it's a point and shoot. And, and this is it here. So it's got a couple drawbacks, especially someone like me that I'm used to using, you know, you know, D Nikon D800E or something like that, you know. So it's very small. Uh, there's no viewfinder, so you have to look through the back LCD. Also, the other drawback is it doesn't create RAW files. It only shoots JPEG. In infrared photography, white balance is super important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And... That's a big drawback if your camera could not create raw files because many times you need to very, you know, really correct the white balance. And it's much easier to do with a raw file than it is with a JPEG where the white balance is already baked into it. Now, fortunately, this camera does allow you to create a custom white balance setting. And that's what I did and it they give you actually they do when you get the camera they tell you exactly how to get the custom white balance setting what you need to do and it's very easy so that's good so I was able to get a nice custom white balance setting so that my infrared images came out pretty good and I'm just gonna go over some of this now um, now we know this spectrum we talked about this it's roughly 400 to 700 is visible light. Anything below that is filtered out by the atmosphere, hopefully, of the Earth. And anything above 700 millimeters is starting to approach infrared. And if you buy an infrared converted camera, you could get them converted to a specific um, wavelength, meaning 
you could have them converted so they block almost all visible light. You could have them converted so they accept a little visible light. Or you could get them converted so they accept a little more visible light. And for an example, this image is converted at 720 nanometers. So effectively, uh, it's, it's blocking out just about all the visible light. So anything above that is being allowed in. And this is the result of a color image. After some processing, we're going to talk about process. I'm going to actually show you how to process an infrared image. So this is after processing, you get this. Now you can see there's not a lot of color coming through because it's infrared that's got through. And your sensor is going to act in an odd way to infrared light. And this is what you get. Now some people don't like this. They, they want a little more color to come through. So what they might choose to do is get it converted to 665 nanometers. And 665 nanometers is in here somewhere, right? So right here. So it's right around here. So you're letting in a little more. The red's approaching orange. So you're letting some of that light in. So when you do that, you'll get this. It's got a little more color than the 720. Some people prefer even more color. And they'll go with 590 nanometers. And when they go with 590, you can see there's a lot more color. And it really gives you an odd kind of look here. And if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, 590 millimeters, nano, nanometers, I'm sorry, is right here. So you're letting in all this light plus the infrared light. And you're blocking all that light. So that, some people like that. And actually, when I first started looking at infrared images, I liked the 720 the best. But the more I'm getting into it, I kind of like the 590 better now. I don't know why, but, you know, I don't know. I guess get into it a little more. But so you have these choices. Now, when you, uh, if you're shooting black and white, these do have more, uh, some changes to black and white also, but they're a little more subtle. This is 720 in black and white. Now, I got to warn you, um, I pilfered these image, images from Kalari Vision's website, all right? And the at least their vision their 720 black and white image is kind of um blurry compared to the 665 and that's not because 720 nanometers are blurry it's just because this specific image is a little blurry all right so this one is 665 and then this one is 590 so there's the the differences between the three different popular cutoff frequencies are subtle in black and white and they're a little more distinct for color. So that's something you decide. If you're going to get a camera converted that you already own, you would send it there and you would tell them which um, conversion you want. 720, 665, or 590. Now there are some other conversions involved uh, that they have. They're a little more boutique, I'd say. They're not popular. And you get again, I'll have the links below, and you could check out their websites and see samples of the different images at these different frequencies and see what works for you. Now, I purchased that point and shoot camera and I got it at 720. So I went out shooting with it very first day and I brought along my Nikon D eight hundred E with me. So I kind of took one shot with the Nikon and one shot with the Panasonic. This is a shot I took with the Nikon. This is in Buffalo, the back steps of the Buffalo Historical Society. Just shooting out. This is called Mirror Lake. That's a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Now, here's the same exact scene captured in infrared with that point and shoot camera. Now, this is a micro four thirds camera, and this is a full frame uh, with a two to three ratio or three to two ratio sensor. So, of course, it's longer. But this is what you get. Now I say this is what you get, but a lot of people don't realize it until after they purchase an infrared camera or convert one, that this is what you get after you do some stuff in Photoshop. Now there are other programs. You could use GIMP. You could do other things. You don't need Photoshop specifically to do this, but what I'm going to show you is done in Photoshop, all right? And these websites still, they will tell you other things you could use 
to try to get this converted because when your image comes out of the camera, it looks like this. At least the 720 nanometer image looks like this. Now, again, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage with this camera because it shoots JPEG only. So that white balance was baked in. Now, it explains when you get the camera that you could uh, get a custom white balance and it suggests, it, it, at least Kalari Vision for this camera suggested that I get a custom white balance by shooting a picture of green grass. And that would be my custom white balance. And it explains exactly how to do it. For the other two frequencies, it explains you should shoot like a white piece of paper to get a white balance. So I got a custom white balance by shooting at green grass. And this is what we came up with. Now, one thing about infrared, it tends to be noisy. And it doesn't matter if you use a filter on the front of your lens or if you're using a camera that's been converted. You get a lot of noise. And as you can see, if you have this uh, video playing in HD at a high uh, resolution, you could see that there is a considerable amount of noise. And when you get a lot of noise, you lose definition. And that's kind of against my shooting style. My sh shooting style is such that I have like a lot of definition in my images. Um, that's just my style. So that kind of is tough for me because what happens is when I, I, I need to get rid of the noise and when you get rid of the noise, um, it softens the image. So that's something to keep in mind because I know a lot of people like a lot of definition in their images. So now I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how I process them. A little bit I've been involved with it. I found a couple great groups on Facebook. Um, one group in particular and everyone does it a little different they have their own little quirks of how they do it and some people really labor over it and they come up with some gorgeous gorgeous images I'm gonna give you kinda of the the basics of processing and to give you an idea of what we need to do now I'm gonna process this image now it's not gonna end up looking exactly like this one because I used a, an external program Topaz to noise to get rid of the noise and I'm not gonna do that here because we don't have enough time. So because of that, we probably won't have as much contrast and definition in this one when we're finished with it. Uh, but what I do is I will take this image and I will do some basic processing. I brought the highlights down. I opened up the shadows. I adjusted the whites and blacks to visually be pleasing. I added some clarity and some vibrance. I didn't add any saturation. I go to the tone curve and added strong contrast in this case. And then um, what I didn't do, what I will do now, is uh, for the noise. So what typically is, I'll just adjust to get rid of noise. And I'm just going to do it real quick for now. I take my time if we weren't in the video to do this a little better. So there's still a little noise in there, but I think that's good enough. So we got rid of that. So that's all I really do. All right, so in Lightroom for now. Now we need to send this over into Photoshop and there's specific things we need to do in Photoshop to get the colors swapped so that you end up with something more like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on this and we're gonna go to Edit In. And we're gonna go to Edit In Adobe Photoshop and we're gonna edit, um, edit the original, all right? And it's going to send it over there, overwrite settings. We'll do that because I think it didn't see a setting or something there. All right, it opened in um, Adobe Camera Raw, so I'm just going to open it into um, Photoshop. There it is there. All right, so we're in Photoshop now. Now, I'm going to duplicate it. Now, those of you that aren't real familiar with Photoshop, uh, this is kind of basic stuff in Photoshop. It's nothing too crazy. And I do have a new video series. I have a few video series on Photoshop, but I have a new one that's called Getting Started in Photoshop. And it's meant for photographers who are used to Lightroom that never have used Photoshop. And I encourage you to check out that series of videos. It's ongoing. And I, it will really, I think, help you get... Um, introduced to Photoshop and some of the things you could do in Photoshop. So the first thing I want to do 
is I'm going to duplicate this layer so all the work I do isn't on the original background layer. It's going to be on the layer above it. So I'm going to hit Command J. If you have a PC, you'd hit Control J. So I have this. Now, we're going to do an adjustment to this layer. Now, you could use an adjustment layer or you could just make an adjustment directly to the layer. I'm going to make an adjustment directly to the layer by going up to Image, Adjustments, and then I'm going to Channel Mixer. And then you come up with this Channel Mixer. Now, what we need to do is we need to swap the red and the blue channels. So whatever in the image is designated to be in the red channel, it's going to be treated as though it's blue. And whatever is supposed to be in the blue channel is going to be treated as though it's red. And to do that, we go to Output Channel Red, and we go to here where it says red, and we're going to put zero there. And where it says blue, we're going to put 100 there. Then we go to Output Channel Blue, and where it says red is zero, we're going to make that 100. And where it says blue is zero, or blue is 100, we're going to make that zero. So we swap those channels. So that's just a basic channel swap. And that kind of gets it more looking like those infrared images we're talking about. The next thing that I do, at least, is I go up and I do in another adjustment. I go to Image, and I go to uh, Adjustments, and then I go to Hue and Saturation. The, what I like to do is go to the, to the yellows. And I'll go to the saturation and I'll pull the saturation down. And sometimes it doesn't look like it's doing a whole lot. But I'll pull it down. Then what I'll do is I'll get the eyedropper and I'll like I'll click on like these trees that aren't totally white in the foreground here. Like that. And then I might add to it. I might add some more that looks a little more yellowed. So I bring saturation of that down. And I might bring brightness of that up a little bit also. So as you can see, it's kind of... Uh, sucking out some of the color and when I use that dropper it's doing it to the to the cyan uh, channel or colors so we do that next we go to blues and with blues we typically want to increase the saturation of the blues a little bit like that and you can mess around with this a little bit bring the lightness down and I'd say we're done that's just the basics of what you need to do to convert the image out of camera. There's the image out of camera with some Lightroom adjustments, and there's our conversion. So we're going to quit Photoshop. It's going to ask us to save it. We're going to save it. It's going to ask us where. We're going to save it right where it was. And then it's going to bring us back to Lightroom. Okay, I paused the video, as you could tell, and I came back only because when I brought the JPEG over into Photoshop and then did some modifications to it and saved it, I saved it as, I wasn't paying attention, I saved it as a Photoshop file. So I had to re, um, I had to import that Photoshop file into Lightroom. So that's good, though. We have our original JPEG we could still look at. And then we look at right here, and there is our Photoshop converted file. Then what I'll often do is I will go to uh, do a little bit on this. Like I'll just double check, you know, tighten up some of these, uh, these controls here just to make it more pleasing to my eye. Something like that. So that is the basics of how you would go about um, processing an infrared file and I hope this introduction to infrared photography at least piqued your interest if it's something you're interested in check out those links in the description below the video and you'll be able to get more information about uh, the two different companies and all the I'll even have the link to eBay where I purchased that camera and check it out and um, if you have any questions I'll post them below. I'll do my best to answer them. I don't always get to all the questions on YouTube. There's just sometimes overwhelming, especially when you have like almost 700 videos on YouTube. It gets to be a little bit difficult, but I'll do my best. All right. Thank you, everyone that watches my videos. I truly do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.